Good morning. Howdy. Good to see everyone. Glad you're here in worship today. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we're especially glad that you're here this morning, and we want to offer a warm welcome to you. Um, you can let us know more about yourself through the guest visitor cards that are there in the pews. Um, if you can share um, your name and information, then we'd love to reach out with, to you and uh, share more about our congregation with you in the coming week. Also, if you have prayer concerns, we would love to be in prayer with you. Um, you can share those concerns with us through the cards that are there in the pews before you. Uh, fill that out and hand that to the ushers either during our greeting time in a few moments or um, after the service, and they'll be sure and get those into us so we can join you in prayer. Let's take a look at some of uh, our announcements this week. Um, we've got a variety of things to um, highlight and to, to make mention of. Um, one is that in the back, um, you'll find, I've sent it out on the email, but you'll find a card that's 40 days of prayer for our schools. Now, we started on the first day of school, um, but you can pick those up on your way out and uh, be praying for these first 40 days of the school year to help the schools get started on the right foot. Um, it's based around Dayton's calendar, um, of course, uh, here in Dayton, but of course we're praying for everyone. I know some of y'all are involved in a variety of school districts, and so we're in prayer for, for everyone, but it's, it's kind of guided around um, those, um, uh, that our district here in Dayton. So if you'll take one of those on your way out and add that to your prayer time uh, in the coming month, that'll be appreciated. Also, um, the chimes uh, were installed, as you may have heard, uh, in town um, about two and a half weeks ago or so, and that has been just a really great gift. It picks up on a long tradition of uh, having chimes um, ringing in our community and through our church. Um, M.W. Ford was the one who was the original chime ringer, is the way that I understand it, or at least he's, that's original, pretty original. You'd have to go back further. I'm not sure how you'd get there, but, um, but uh, it kind of restores a great tradition for our church, and we're going to have an official dedication for the chimes uh, next Sunday in worship, too, so uh, that'll be a special um, kind of emphasis. For um, our children today, after Children's Church, or after the Children's Moment, you'll go to Children's Church uh, with Miss Laura and learn um, a song to perform next week during, um, during worship, so um, Go on with her, and then next week, come about 9.30 to be able to practice. Uh, if you come to Sunday school, they'll let you out just a little bit early to go ahead and rehearse for that. So that's coming up um, as well. And there's a couple of things, um, let's see, a couple more things happening. One is on uh, this Tuesday is a MOPS uh, informational meeting at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. So MOPS it stands for Mothers of Preschoolers. Uh, we've been sponsoring a MOPS um, group for what a couple of well, about a year and a half now about a year and a half now um, and so um, mops is a group to help mothers of preschoolers so smaller children um, basically have adult time and kind of have the support that's so important uh, and that's so needed it's a ministry both within our church but it's also really um, focused outward into the community to invite anyone and to really serve any mom uh, whether they're affiliated with our church or, or no church at all, um, anyone who just kind of needs that support group um, is uh, welcome to be a part of it, invited to that. Um, so one function of that is going to be to be an informational meeting for, for moms who might be interested in wanting to learn and connect. But the other side of that is for um, people who would like to help support, that, uh, support MOPS, either by um, filling into some kind of leadership or support role and finding out ways to be involved, um, Marissa Castor and Emily Kerr have been the ones leading that. Um, Emily is having a baby um, at later in September, so she's got her hands full with that a little bit, which means um, that a little bit more support um, will really be appreciated um, some, from some other folks. So if you'd like to learn, just kind of learn more about what MOPS is and about um, how, what kind of help they might need, um, then you can come to that meeting on Tuesday night, uh, 6 o'clock, and just kind of learn more and, and see if um, that might be a good place of service for you. Um, finally, I wanted to lift up a couple of areas um, in the coming uh, months for uh, Bible study opportunities. Um, of course, we always have our Sunday school classes, and 
Um, the Thursday noon Bible study that Margaret uh, leads uh, continues. Um, a couple of opportunities this fall. Um, one is that next Sunday, I'm going to start a sermon series called The Story of God. Um, I like to do this from time to time because it seems to me that um, week in and week out, we end up engaging scripture, um, but oftentimes we find a story here and a story there or a letter here and a letter there, and we um, don't always pay attention to what the big story of the Bible is that kind of follows from Genesis to Revelation. And so from time to time, I like to preach through the big story. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start next week and kind of go basically up to Thanksgiving and kind of look at what the story arc of the whole Bible is, um, just to remember that the Bible isn't just a collection of some stories that we learned at Vacation Bible School, um, but it's, it's one big story about God revealing himself to humanity, whom he created, so that we can know him and know how to be in relationship with him. And so next week we're going to do that. Along with that, um, we're going to have a, um, a reading guide that you can take and incorporate into your Bible reading um, that will kind of take you through um, a lot of places through Genesis to Revelation just to kind of get that grand sweep of the story. Um, sometimes our devotionals pop all over the place, and so we get a lot of good biblical wisdom, but we don't always get the big story, and so we're going to have a reading guide to go along with that. And then um, starting after Labor Day on Thursday nights for the fall, I'm going to teach a Bible study. Um, I'm going to teach a Bible study on a book called The Prodigal God. It is a marvelous study of um, the, the story of the prodigal son. It's a, a parable that you know very well, um, but the book is just a really brilliant insight into how that story really teaches us the, the, the depth of the gospel in a really powerful, powerful way. And so um, I, don't, I don't know of a, of a resource that I have found that really gets at the heart of the gospel the way that this does. So I would invite you to think about that on Thursday nights starting after um, Labor Day. I will be putting out more about that for how you can get connected with that. So things to look forward to um, in the coming weeks and months. All right, at this time, let's stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. I'll do the other. I'll get it. standing for the call to worship. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, O God. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, Every good and perfect gift comes from you. You have blessed us by saving us in Jesus Christ and by filling us with your spirit. Grant that we may be faithful to your call to discipleship as you are faithful to us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is in your hymnal number 707. Let's join our voices in song with the hymn of promise.
And as we turn toward um, our time of prayer together, we want to um, uh, take a few moments of silence in a moment because you come to this time uh, with your own um, prayers, uh, joys, and concerns. One joy we would want to mention in the life of our church is the um, luncheon from this past week. Um, a lot of you came and uh, helped work that. Uh, many of you uh, came and participated in that as um, part of uh, the Dayton ISD School District, and so we're glad that uh, we were able to, um, to do that for you. Um, we had a uh, really fantastic time um, on behalf of Cindy and everyone who worked to put it together. Um, thank you for financial support. Thank you for your presence, for being there, for all the work in the prep day and the, and the day it was um, that we put it on on Wednesday and clean up and everything. It really went um, fantastic. It was a great, um, really a great day to be a Methodist, um, to just open our, our hearts and our doors to, uh, to serve um, our school district. Fed over 750 people, um, so a lot of folks, and it was a real joy to see um, how that luncheon is uh, kind of an encouragement and a blessing as everybody gets started to the school year. So uh, it was a great, great tradition, and uh, thank you to everyone for, for being there and for participating in it. We appreciate it. At this time, let's turn our hearts to prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are great. You are awesome in power. You are majestic. When we look at the heavens, we see your handiwork. As we learn more about how vast this universe is, what an amazing place that it is, and how small we are, we are in awe of your greatness. Heavenly Father, you are good. Out of this vast cosmos, you made us in your image and put us on this tiny little ball of blue and green. A small place in a solar system on the edge of a galaxy but you care for us, you love us deeply and intimately. You cared enough to reveal yourself to us through your word, through the scriptures. You cared enough to reveal yourself to us through your son, Jesus Christ, that we might know you, our creator, and that we might have a relationship with you. And when we turned away in your goodness, you gave of your son to die upon the cross and to take our place so that we might be given his life, the life of a true child of God. Lord, you fill us with your spirit. You sustain us by your grace. In joys and in trials, you never leave us nor forsake us. You walk through us, uh, with us, through every dark valley that we may face. Lord, you are great and you are good. May we be people who glorify you for your greatness and for your goodness, with our words and with our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. As we pray together, the prayer that he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in singing hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. may be seated. As we pause for our offering this morning, uh, we want to remember that our offering can be made either in the offering box in the back of the sanctuary um, as you enter or leave. Um, you can also make your offering online through our church website or at the link provided in our church emails as well. Let's pause and give uh, the Lord thanks. God, we are indeed grateful for your provision in our lives, for your generosity toward us in blessing us. And Lord, we pray that you would receive these tithes and offerings that we bring, that you would bless them, that you would use them to build up your kingdom through the ministry and the work of our church. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
affirmation of faith found on page 881 in your hymnal. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hey kids, it's your time. Please come forward for the children's moment. How? 
how are y'all? Good. So we got school for most of us started last week, and we got a first full week going. And, you know, as I was getting my school supplies ready, I started looking at the different types of pencils. And I got to thinking, I bet God kind of thinks of us sometimes as a pencil. Have you ever thought about that? Let me, let me kind of give you an example. Take a look at this pencil. It is not sharpened, and it doesn't have an eraser on either end. It's not sharpened. It's supposed to be sharpened on both sides. And I bet this pencil reminds God that these are the type of people that don't sharpen their skills, that don't come prepared, so they do nothing. Oh, I don't think God wants us to be that kind of person. Do you? I bet not. Now take a look at this pencil. This pencil has erasers on both sides. Hmm. I bet this pencil reminds God of people who are too scared to sharpen their skills, their, their talents that God gives them, and so they don't take any risk. They don't do anything. They're too scared to make mistakes. You know what? I don't think God wants us to be so grounded in fear. He wants us to be grounded in faith, right? So I don't think that's the kind of person God wants us to be either. Oh, now look at this one. This one has a pencil, and it's sharpened on both ends, and it doesn't even have an eraser. I bet this reminds God of people who think they do no wrong, that they are perfect. Hmm. You know what? There's only been one perfect person in this whole world that walked this earth, and that's Jesus. We all make mistakes. And so I don't think that God wants us to be like this for people who never think they make a mistake, and if they do, they blame others. <gasps> God doesn't want us to be that way, does he? No. Nope. I've got the fourth pencil right here, and it's sharpened on one end, and it has an eraser on the other. And I think this is the type of person God wants us to be. Sharpened, always prepared, right? Sharpen our skills. And if we make a mistake, and we will, we all do, we take that eraser and first we have to do three things. We have to first admit we made a mistake. Then we have to learn by that mistake. And then we need to ask God to erase that mistake, and he will make our lives clean again. So I think that's kind of the person God wants us to be, always sharpening our skills, don't be afraid to make mistakes, admit mistakes if we do make them, learn from them, and ask God for forgiveness. Will you remember that? Now, after we've prayed, you're going to go with Miss Laura, but I also have some pencils for you. And I'm going to give it to her, so after y'all practice, you can give them to her. So let's pray. Bow your heads and repeat after me. Dear Lord, help us to remember that we all make mistakes. And that if we ask you for forgiveness, you will erase those mistakes and make us clean again. In your name we pray. Amen. Right. Um, choir, awesome job. Thank y'all so much. That was fantastic. John, thank you for um, your great music. We love it. It's a blessing to us every week. Our scripture this week is 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, um, verse nine, uh, chapter 9, rather, beginning in verse 6. Um, we're looking this week again. Last week we looked at um, 
worship and study, and this week we're looking at serving and giving, and the reason we're doing that is because our church mission is leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus, and that mission is something that we um, both um, do as a church, but we also um, have, it speaks to us as well, because we're always needing to grow in our relationship with Jesus. None of us are completely fully formed disciples yet. We're all in process, and so that's what we're about. Um, but of course, if we know that's our mission, then we have to think about um, how are we going to do that, and how can we um, create a kind of a framework for practically what that looks like. And so what we look at doing is we say that we're going to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus um, through worship, study, serving, and giving together in community. And as we invite ourselves to do, invite people to do that with us, um, we know that through those things, we're going to have encounters with God. We're going to grow in our faith in Christ. Some people are going to meet Christ and others of us are going to go deeper in our relationship and uh, grow with him in ways that we've never grown before. Um, as we learn how to um, learn how to be his disciples. So let's take a look um, this week. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service which you have provided, uh, which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you and their, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we give you thanks for your word in the scriptures by which you reveal yourself to us, most importantly, in your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. We pray these moments together that you would speak your word and that you would write your word upon our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit at work among us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, I was part of a cohort, uh, kind of a learning cohort of pastors, um, and we met quarterly for a few days um, to go through um, kind of a curriculum together to learn and grow in our uh, pastoral leadership and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the most important things, as usually is the case in these kinds of uh, continuing education experiences, is not just the things that you're learning, but it's the people that you're learning them with. And so the relationships that we formed were really, really um, powerful and influential. And that was one of the things that I remember most and still carry with me. Well, I remember um, one of the, those retreats, um, we had a time where we began um, with kind of a check-in on what was going on with us lately to kind of bring ourselves up to speed on the last few months so that we'd have a chance to know who, how everyone was doing and kind of what they were bringing into, the, into that retreat. And I remember um, one, of, um, one of my friends from that group who I had known a little bit beforehand, but really got to go deeper with uh, during those couple of years, um, came and he shared uh, essentially this. Um, he had been um, a hard driving, very hard working um, pastor for many years. He'd been in a church where they, uh, he arrived there and they were in the middle of a building program and to relocate their congregation, um, things had uh, in the 
part of the suburbs where they had been uh, had grown in such a way where the, the best thing for their congregation to do was to relocate to another um, spot and to reopen uh, their building there so that their church would be positioned um, in a way where it could reach the community better. And so um, that was something that he had, uh, he had been a part of, and then he'd gone to the next church and um, had been part of uh, raising funds and opening new ministries, and he had just been working, 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 which is um, good to do. God wants us to have a good work ethic, but he was on the edge of just burning out and took a little bit of um, his church kind of gave him a little bit of a sabbatical time to help him kind of catch up and have a time to step away and he came off of that time and this is what he said when we gathered together he said it was really good for me to step back for a little while i have been filling a role but now i got to remember that i am a soul not just a role I have a soul, not just a role. Now, you and I fulfill many roles in our lives. Um, maybe we have had a role or have a role of being uh, a spouse, a husband, or a wife. Maybe we have a role of being a parent. Maybe we have a role of being a grandparent, an aunt, and uncle. There's all kinds of family relationship roles that we play. Maybe we've had a role of being a mentor uh, to someone. Maybe we've um, many of you are in education and you have a role of teaching uh, young people and relating with parents and relating with uh, faculty and uh, staff and whatnot. Um, you have roles through your work. You have roles through what you do in the community. But it's so important for us to stay grounded in the fact that we are more than just the roles that we fulfill. We, we have a soul, and which is much deeper than our roles. My roles will come and go. Right now, I am a, a parent. I'm a father with three children in high school. When they were born so close together, we were told, oh my gosh, they're going to be in high school all at the same time. <laughs> and I have told friends who know us since that time, the year has finally arrived when that is true. You said it the day the youngest was born. Now it's, we're here. Um, but you know, in a few years, my role's going to change. I'm not going to be the parent of somebody who's in my house anymore. I'll ha be a father, but that role will change its dynamic. Um, I'm a pastor. That's one of my roles. But you know, at some point, I won't be a pastor of a congregation. Um, at some point, um, I don't know, 20, 25 years from now, whatever, I'll have a different role. I'll show up, I'll sit in a pew, and I'll need to be thinking, um, I wonder what the Lord has for me today, instead of, I'm not sure I would have preached that just that way. You know, my role is going to change. Our roles, um, the, the way that we're relating to our, the things that we do and the people that we know, those can change over time, and those always morph and shift around, especially as you move within family relationships, as kids grow older, and as maybe you have grandchildren, or maybe this, that, or the other changes. Those roles are always going to shift around and change, but the one thing that will always be the same is that you have a soul. You have an eternal soul. No matter what your roles do, you have a soul. And one of the most important things in life is to make sure that our soul is always growing at or beyond where our role is. Y'all with me on that? The most important things in life is to make sure that our role never gets passed out in front of our, our soul. A lot of people in leadership have a hard time because they're working so hard. And I mean leadership like leading your family, leading your classroom, leading your workplace, whether um, you may not be at the top of the food chain, but somewhere there's someone who you're influencing and it's really important that you're doing that. Sometimes we're influencing people upward and sideways and, and downward. 
just because of the role that we have in our, in our company or organization or what have you. So we always are, are having an influence and having roles of leadership. But one of the challenges is when, when our soul isn't on track with where, with where our role is. We always need our soul to be growing at least at the same rate or faster or, or more so than our role that we're filling. Because otherwise, that is a quick way to run out of gas. Like I mentioned last week, I told about running out of gas on the way to the job interviews. Not one of my best moments. But the deeper way I want to connect that is if we're not careful to tend to our soul and to make sure our soul is growing, then we're going to run out of gas in the roles that we fill and we're going to be running on fumes. Don't raise your hands. We know what that feels like, don't we? Um, we all do. So that's a little bit of a twist on what I think about when I think about our, the mission of our church and the way that we talk about it is leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. I, I really appreciate the way we say it, one, because it's very simple. It simply says what the Great Commission says, but just in a, in a simple kind of way. And it says two things. It says that we want to lead people into a relationship with Jesus because we know that that is what everybody most needs is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And... I appreciate that our mission statement knows that we can't leave it simply at that. That it's not just a relationship with Jesus as in, Jesus, here's so-and-so, so-and-so, here's Jesus. Oh, nice to meet you, good, and then leave it at that. No, it's a growing relationship with Jesus, and that means that that's something that applies to, to all of us, to every one of us, that we always need to be growing in our relationship with Jesus. Why? Because if we aren't growing in our relationship with Jesus, then our role is going to get way out in front of our soul and we're going to be running on fumes in our life. It is vital to have a growing relationship with Jesus. But of course, that is easy to say, but we have to think about how we're going to do that in a practical kind of way. And so for our church life, a very simple way to frame that up is to say, well, what do we do then to make sure that our, our soul is growing uh, along with our role or hopefully outpacing it maybe is that we can do simple things we can worship we can study we can serve and we can give in community together that's um, doing those simple practices is doing what that catholic spiritual writer i mentioned last week henry Nouwen said which is in the spiritual life those disciplines practices things that we do Outward things that we do are simply things that create a space in which God can act. So we show up and then we know that God is going to work on us because we showed up and made ourselves available to him. When we come to worship, we come to express our praise and our thanks to God. Absolutely. And within that, God recenters us on him. It's not just we don't only express our faith and our love towards God. We get filled and strengthened in the love of God as well. And when we study, we open the word and we talk about it together and we, um, among those relationships, and we're filling our mind with God's word so that somewhere in the midst of our week, God's word is in our minds and not just the word of everything that we read on social media or on news websites or on cable news or on TV shows or movies or whatever else. There's a lot of words coming at us real fast and they all want to influence our thinking. And if we're not anchored in the scripture, then we're gonna have a lot of words forming our soul and not the word of God forming our soul. So study in community is something that's so vital because it transforms us by the renewing of our mind. That's what Paul said. So that's kind of a little rehash of last week, but this week we want to look at serving and giving. Serving and giving. Now, on the one hand, these are things that you know something about. So what I want to do is just kind of bring back to the forefront um, why these are so powerful for us um, 
and why you already kind of have a deep connection to them. But one of the things that we do is we, is we serve. Jesus, in John's gospel, gathers with the disciples for the last time before he will be betrayed and tried and convicted and crucified. And John shares for several chapters about what happened on that night together. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell the story of the Last Supper, and they tell it kind of succinctly, and they tell us about the gathering together and celebrating Passover, the breaking of bread, um, and what Jesus did. But they don't really tell a whole lot about all the conversation that happened. Well, John, if you open up, starting around uh, chapter 13, it's almost all red print. You know, if you've got one of the red letter Bibles, it's talking about all the things that Jesus was talking about with the disciples. At the very beginning of that, it says, at this time he wanted to show them the full extent of his love. And so when they were gathered together, he took off his outer garment and took a towel and wrapped it around himself and he went and he washed each of their feet. Now you know that's because the washing of feet was something that a servant did as an act of hospitality and welcome to gather together for the meal. Uh, their feet were gritty from wearing sandals all the time and walking everywhere and just tired and there was something just really refreshing about having their feet washed and it felt so good. You know, if you've ever been tired, humid, sweaty, and just ugh, um, you know how nice it is if you can sit on the side of a pool and just put your feet in the water, right? Or maybe pull your beach chair right up to the edge where the water's up there, but it's not going to come and swamp you away, but just sit your feet in the water and it feels so good. Uh, that's kind of the idea, right? That Jesus washed their feet as they gathered together. He took the role of a servant. I love, Andy Stanley said it this way in a talk once. He said, what do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room? He said, no one was ever a more powerful person in a room than Jesus on that night with the disciples in the upper room. And what Jesus did was he took off his outer cloak and he got down and he served the others. They said, you're our master and teacher. We should be serving you. And he said, well, yes, but I have given you an example. And what I've done for you, do for one another. You know, when we serve one another, which we have such a remarkable, you know, just tradition of being a serving kind of congregation. Just with the luncheon this week, that was one of the most fun things I found out about when I first got here four years ago. Um, but there's all kinds of other ways that we participate in service, both serving our congregation kind of in the life of our church together and serving in the ministries that point out towards the community. We've got a great tradition as a serving kind of church. And the difference that makes in our soul is that we orient ourselves a little more toward um, the humility and the servanthood of our Savior. The imitation of Jesus moving ourselves outward. Serving is something that feels good to do. It feels so good to serve, and in, in particular, you know, this past Wednesday, it felt so good for people to come in because everybody that came in was so grateful and, and expressed thanks and was so encouraged, and that felt good to serve. You know when it doesn't feel real good to serve somebody? is when you serve and then they gripe and complain at you. Don't raise your hands. I know you know what I'm talking about, right? Don't raise your hands. I know some of us have been in a situation where we were distracted, anxious, um, upset, frazzled, whatever, and we were grouchy to somebody who was trying to help us out and just, just serve us a little bit. Jesus sets us an example to say the way that he wanted to show the full extent of his love was to go down and to take the position of a servant. Take the position of a servant. One of my favorite um, 
quotes along this line um, is attributed to Mother Teresa, who's, who, of course, is kind of who we associate with humble service, you know, in the 20th century, um, where she's attributed of saying, there are no great things, only small things done with great love. That's the heart of service, isn't it? We don't have to do great things. Sometimes God takes the little things we're doing and he makes them really great. But the way that we can have the servant heart of Jesus in a daily kind of way is just to see small things and do them with great love. And in so doing, both be blessing others, but also be creating a space in which God can act on our own heart and just continue to grow us in a heart of servitude. That's a powerful resource for our souls. Because if we have a soul that's shaped by, um, by the servant heart of Jesus, who can search for small things to do with great love regardless of the response, then that's, um, that's a soul that uh, can stand up and can be in good health no matter what happens with our role, right? And the second one I want to talk about today is, is about giving. Now, giving is the thing that when you mention that in church, everybody just tenses up just a little bit. Well, not sure. But it's amazing because the Bible has more to say about um, generosity and giving than it does about prayer, believe it or not. Why? Because it's such a powerful thing on our soul. On our soul. There's a true story of um, a, a family who went on family vacation. Uh, they were taking a, a week or two and driving out west. This is not us, although we went out west this, this summer. But uh, a family that went out west for the summer and were um, taking in some of the great parks and the mountains of the western United States. And uh, they had given each of the kids um, some money to be their vacation spending money. And so when they went out, they went to the different parks, they got to do the scenic drives, they got to take the hikes, they got to go to the gift shops, all the different things, and had just a marvelous time. Well, um, they were at uh, a gift shop for one of the um, places that they had visited, and one of the daughters came up, and it was just in the first few days of the trip, and um, said to her father, hey, what do you think of this, what do you think of this cap? And he said, well, I think it's pretty cool, but that, remember now, um, we've given you your vacation spending money, and that's what you've got, so, you know, you want to think about it if you want to spend it all here in the first couple of days. Um, Y'all all know that some people are spend it all at the first beginning of the vacation, and some are save it all and spend it right at the end of the vacation people. Um, and that sort of continues into adulthood too, doesn't it? But he was just wanting her to be mindful about how to spend her money. And so she said, well, oh yeah, I know dad, I know dad, but don't, but what do you think about it? Don't you think it looks nice? Yeah, I do think it looks nice. I think it's a really cool cap, but you know, you want to make sure that that's how you want to spend your money because we're still in the first couple of days of the vacation. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Well, that evening they got back to their hotel where they were staying and um, they had had dinner, they were getting ready for night and the daughter took her little sack and brought it out and said, Dad, I got this cap for you. I just think it would look really great on you and gave it to him. And of course, then he just, you know, it was all over. It was done. Um, no more lecturing about when you should be being careful about spending your money and all that kind of stuff. It was just the heart of a father who had had a child who wanted to do something for him. Now, there's a couple things embedded in that simple little story. Um, one is that when we give, we get to bring delight to the Father. When we give, we get to bring delight to the Father and we get to participate in being a generous person just like God has already been generous toward us. Because that little story also includes something that C.S. Lewis pointed out. 
that for God, our giving isn't supplying him with something that he doesn't have, right? Um, he gave the daughter the vacation spending money. She was giving to him simply out of what he had given to her. So it was already his anyway, but it was delightful because of what she had chosen to do, was to give back. Giving is something God wants for us, not from us. God wants it for us because when we give, we grow in our trust, we grow in a generous, um, open-handed kind of heart, and we grow in that focus that's outward towards others, just like service and giving kind of go hand in hand, serving with our time and our talents and serving with our treasure. It's all kind of bundled up in there together, and it's the kind of thing that really works and creates a, a soul that has depth and substance. No matter how our roles may shift and change, that soul work that God's doing when we serve and when we give is so, so vitally important. We live like within and for our roles, but we live out of our soul. That's what we have to give. So what kind of soul do you want to have? At my sister's wedding is the first time I really remember uh, experiencing one of the marvelous inventions of mankind, the chocolate fountain. I went over and there were toothpicks and there was all kinds of things and in the center there was just a wall of chocolate and it looked like it was moving. And I had never seen that kind of thing before. And I took a toothpick and I poked it in one of the little banana pieces and I stuck it in there. And sure enough, chocolate all over the banana piece. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, you could do strawberries. You could do, it was kind of like frying things at the Texas State Fair. You could just take anything you wanted and stick it in the chocolate fountain. And uh, that chocolate fountain just kept on going. And it, you know, no matter how much chocolate that you that you drew from it to put it on the things that you're sticking in there to eat, it just kept coming. There was just more and more and more and more. It never ran dry, the chocolate fountain. Now, what kind of soul do you want? <laughs> what kind of soul do you want? Do you want a soul that is on the edge of being running on fumes and getting on empty because we're living in our roles and we're just living, 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 giving, 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 but without the soul grounding and the soul work? that it takes to have our foundation strongly in Jesus and to be more of a fountain where God's pouring into us and it's just pouring out over because we're letting God pour into us that we're just overflowing and we're just passing along to others what God's pouring into us and it's just kind of coming out. What kind of soul do you want? What kind of soul do you, do you need? That's what we're about. Leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus is helping us connect to the one who um, can pour into us and deepen and ground and strengthen our soul so that we can handle any of the challenges, any of the, the things that come in our life because we're grounded in Jesus. Let us pray. Oh God, you're not interested only in the things that you give us to do, but in who you're calling us to be. In fact, the things that you call us to do are really always connected to who you're shaping us to be. And Lord, we all have such important, significant contributions to make in our families, in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools. Lord, we want to open our hearts, open our minds, open our, our very life so that you can come in and shape our soul to match our role. So Lord, in community, 
and in our personal lives. Ground us in worship, in study, in serving, and in giving in ways that expand and enrich our soul so that as we fulfill our roles, it would not simply be on our own steam, but that it would be you pouring into us and that we would let you overflow from us to others. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. As we do so, we would open the altar of the church. If you would come to profess your faith in Christ or renew your commitment to him, we would welcome you as you come. If you would come to seek prayer, we would welcome you as well. Let's sing together. Let us sing the three verses of the gift of love, page 408 in the hymnal. Go forth um, today, go forth with this blessing and benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit at work within you. Go in the peace, the power, and the presence of Christ to be his witnesses. Amen. <laughs>